Hey guys, it's Jason Creel and you're watching The Lawn Care Life. Today I've got a special guest, John Pajak. And John is uh, lives in Indiana outside of Chicago and he deals mostly with cool season grasses. I deal with warm season grasses down in Alabama. And so what we're going to do, we're going to go through the calendar year and we're going to do a side-by-side -side comparison. John's going to tell you what we're doing in certain months of the year on cool season grasses. I'm going to... Also uh, do the same with the warm season grasses. So hopefully no matter what kind of grass you've got, from Bermuda grass, St. Augustine, to Kentucky blue, ryegrass, fescue, we're going to hopefully cover uh, some topics that will help you uh, know what to do each month of the year for your grass. All right, let's get started right now. John and I are down here at the Hype House in the Tampa, Florida area. And uh, being joined by some of our friends, this, this is... Uh, put on this event by the Hardscape Academy, which is Caleb and Brittany Allman, and then also Brian and Liz Fullerton have the Entrepreneur Academy. So go check those out when you have time. There's resources whether you're looking to get into hardscaping or a lawn maintenance business. All right, now as far as the calendar goes, John, let me. Uh, January is, is probably not a very active month, if I had to guess, for, for the cool season grass. So t mm -hmm. take me. Uh, let's go January and February. Does anything happen at all in January or February for you guys? For us, it's all preparation at that point. We're not doing anything for the lawns. We're staying off the lawns. We usually have snow or the, 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 the turf is frozen during those months. So stay off the lawn. Uh, but we do a lot of prep for the upcoming okay. season. But what about if somebody lived in, if they lived in, Tennessee, let's say, mm -hmm. and they don't, they maybe get just a little bit of snow. Would they be doing anything January, February, or is the grass basically, it's not, the cold, wet, like I've, we sometimes oversee our grasses in mm -hmm. Alabama with a, a rye grass or something like that, and it doesn't really grow much, even though we're not buried in snow. So right. do they, is there anything needed on a cool season lawn? If it's not, obviously if it's covered in snow, nothing happens. Right. But if it's not covered in snow in areas, uh, like I said, Tennessee, uh, mm -hmm. uh, transition zones, are they doing anything January, February? Generally they're not. They're, uh, they're especially, anytime there's frozen turf, like even if you're down in Tennessee, if it, if it gets cold enough and the turf is frozen, you want to just stay off the lawn. You do not want to put any product in there because it's, it's, all it's going to do is it's going to run off. Uh, there are some, you could possibly do a, a winter seeding, which has mixed results. The only time I would ever do that is if the, there was a really, I knew the lawn and it had a bunch of bare areas and you wanted to put that down while there, uh, and I'm talking this is further north where I'm at, uh, putting down seed so when the freeze-thaw cycle happens, the seed could naturally get worked into the soil. And then as spring starts, it gives that grass a chance to germinate, but more than likely you're going to have to overseed it again. It, you know how seed is. It's, yeah. uh, it could be temperamental. But uh, during those months, January and February, and even March, I'm going to jump the, the gun here and just head straight into March, uh, we generally don't do too much until the, until the soils out. All right, so jumping over to the warm season side, if you know, for us, uh, we're not covered. Now, I, you might have areas in like Oklahoma, let's say, where maybe they they do get some snow. But for us in Alabama, uh, and this deals with Bermuda grass, zoysia grass, centipede grass, St. Augustine grass. I, I my lawn care business, I get out and start spraying on January the second, usually if the weather's okay. So, um, and the reason is the clock is ticking on me. I, I, I know that on a warm year, my crabgrass may start germinating uh, as early as, as you know mid to late February. And if you're further south, that could happen even sooner. And so I'm trying to get that pre-emergent out before the crabgrass germinates. So you know, with hundreds of customers, I need to start um, early January and I, I try to take advantage of any warm day because we get cold sometimes too and right rain so I, i'm really trying to make the most of any days when it gets up in the 40s and 50s and, and even 60s for us sometimes get as many yards done as possible so what am i doing in january february i'm putting out uh, prodiamine which is a uh, very commonly used pre-emerge application that's what's going to help 
get ahead of the crabgrass, hopefully, and uh, other summer weeds as well. And I mix it with a three-way product called Triplet and another product, a post-emergent called Atrazine. So those are going to help if, if maybe some weeds have already germinated or you've got some uh, cool season weeds that are hanging around. You, you've got uh, dandelions, hen bit, purple dead nettle, you know, common as I see. And you may have to, uh, if you haven't done any fall pre-emergent, then you, you may have lots of those cool season weeds and even some grassy weeds like uh, poa annua, you may have uh, ryegrass and fescue clumps that you want to knock out. So those are the situations where you want to go spot treat those. But my blanket application, trying to cover literally every square inch of the yard, is the prodiamine, the atrazine, the triplet, and then I'm also uh, mixing in surfactant to help it, you know, stick to the plant and be, uh, but be a more effective application. Um, all right, let's go to. March, do you do anything in March? Yeah, right, right, at, right at the end of March. Usually All, right. It, it goes. All right, so we're moving forward to, um, let's jump forward to, so that's me, round one. And, and um, some people will take two applications and, and do, do what they call split pre and post emergence. So they might do what I just did and come back and do another round after that, like late February on into March. Um, but you want to get your pre emergent out before the crabgrass germinates or it's mm -hmm. not going to be as effective. If you are running late with your pre emergent, you might have to go to a product like Dimension or right. something like that that could help knock out the crabgrass if it's already germinating. But, John, uh, for the cool season grasses, like when does the game really start where like all the all the business, the spray business in your area are out doing something, and what are they doing? Like very late, like, like probably like the last week of March is usually when things start to open up for us and definitely in April. Okay. It's always, you know, it's wet, especially if we had a lot of snow, but, uh, you know, we kick off with pre-emergent. We usually, it's more common up by us to use uh, dimension. Uh, the reason for that, I've used prodiamine before and it works well in our area, uh, but the, the thing that separates dimension and prodiamine is that dimension can get, um, can stop the crabgrass up to I think it's three or four tillers. Yeah. So if you if you're late on your application, you could put that out. And with the way our season goes, Dimension's been very good for us mm -hmm. because sometimes we can't get out even until maybe mid-April, and that's starting to get late in the game because if you start watching your soil temperatures and your weather tracking, mm -hmm. if you can't get it down before temperatures are consistently uh, below 55 degrees, you're probably going to have a, a long battle that whole year fighting crabgrass. Yeah, right and right. I think it's worth saying that the crab, if you can get the crabgrass with a pre emergent it's not going to be cheaper and more effective. Than, it's not that there's no solutions with a post emergent but right. they're more expensive and it's more difficult and it's a pain. So the pre emergent is definitely the way to go. Right, plus, you know, you have to, if you don't get your pre emergent down, you're going to have to carry on your truck. A, a, a always have an extra backpack with like say Clorac and some yeah. methylated seed, seed oil mixed in and it may not be every single lawn but it's like okay we gotta have this some lawns need a couple touch-ups so there might be some that if you missed it or they started late that might it, it derails your entire timing and everything when you're uh, you're just trying to complete the job so yeah pre-emergence save you time money you put that in the invest in that in the beginning and it helps keep the, the lawns cleaner longer. Now are you mixing and, anything in there with that? Yeah, the first, uh, it, it, it really depends. If we have an early start, we're usually just spraying out the um, uh, dimension, and then we, because of our the way our uh, grass starts growing, we grow, you know, the ideal temperatures for Kentucky bluegrass, tall fescue, and, and the rye grasses that are in our area, they love it when it's like between 50 degrees and like 75. They'll go all the way up to 80, but then they kind of fade off. But those temperature, that temperature range is when they love it. And we will throw out a, uh, a low dose of nitrogen just to kind of, uh, get, you know, get the lawn to pop. It kind of just gets it to wake up a little bit quicker. Uh, but we're talking low rates. We're, we're talking like a, a quarter pound to maybe maybe a half a pound with a, my program i it's i think it's 0.3 uh, pounds of nitrogen per thousand uh, but usually that would cover our first round is 
because it's too early for post-emergent weed control. Uh, you know, there's, in, in my opinion, there's no point in blanket spraying something that may not be there, especially with our cooler weather temperatures. Our, you know, even dandelions and things, they're, they're not going to be popping at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, that would roll into our second round, mm -hmm. which really starts like early May, you know, right about May. Our, we have a gap. You, we try to get it to where our first application and our second application are about four weeks apart on that round. Okay, so so for the cool season, you know, they're they're, they're getting their pre-emergent out later, obviously, and and because of the spring season, that is like ideal time to be growing these cool season grasses. They go ahead and put a little bit of fertilizer in there, if I if I'm hearing you correct. Where mm -hmm. for us, our Bermuda and zoysias and centipedes, say, you know, they're just now waking up in the spring, so they they're not uh, doesn't have a lot of green color to them. Oftentimes in the spring. Now, obviously, you know, if you live in Florida, it, they're green earlier, the further south and warmer weather. It, you know, they may stay green year round, but um, where I live in Alabama, uh, it, our grass is in March, I mean, it, it, depending on the, if it's a warm March or cold March, but it, it's just starting to transition, okay? So you got to be a little bit careful in those situations. So, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I, I should also add, on my round one, when I'm spraying centipede and St. Augustine yards, I'm not using triplets. So it's just atrazine and prodiamine. Yeah. Uh, you got to... You have to use uh, very low rates of 2,4-D. A triple has 2,4-D in it. You got to use low rates of 2,4-D on your centipede thing I'm seeing. But as you, as we move into like for me, and I'm changing things up this year. But if you go into round two, uh, for me, I, I'm delaying my round two until we get into March. And so I'm going to go ahead and put out uh, this is a little bit different strategy. But I'm going ahead and put out a polymer coated slow release fertilizer in March. And you think that's really too early? Uh, for, for the fertilizer to be ideal because the grass is not, not doing a whole lot, but because it's a slow release polymer coat of fertilizer, it's just going to sit there and then when the weather does start warm up, it'll start releasing the nutrients. So I'm having to rely a little bit on the technology and the chemistry to help me out in that situation um, because it's not an ideal time to fertilize, but I, there's a reason I'm doing that because I want to come back in May when there is an ideal time to fertilize and I'm, I'm trying to do some more weed control. So I'm mm -hmm. trying to uh, be strategic about that. So, um, so that that's what I'm doing. But John is, and you can spot treat. You know, with the want to make one important point here. When, when your grass, when your centipede and St. Augustine are in transition, you want to be really careful um, what herbicides you use on them. So, because what you can end up doing is uh, delaying the green up or even turning them yellow. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it just looks weird. You know, why is my yard yellow and my neighbor's yard, who didn't do anything, is is perfectly green? Uh, and sometimes that's because of herbicide down. You can spray them a little more aggressively when they're brown. You can spray them when they're fully green. It's just during that transition period. Right. All right, so moving over to the cool season grass, we get over into, what are we, like May or so? It, it would be around yeah, two. About around two starts right. in May. So what, what would you be doing uh, that time of year? And that time, that's when, you know, you can see if your, your crabgrass pre-emergence already down, it's not really going to show if it's working until like late May, mm -hmm. early June. But at that point, that's when, uh, if we have a really bad lawn, a lot of times we'll do a split application. So it's kind of base by base. We'll do a half of application of pre-emergent first round, second round. We'll, yeah, it just kind of helps extend it, the, okay. the, the, the coverage that it gets. But uh, tr our, our program is a little bit different than others, I think, because we put down our rub control early. We use a celeprin, and we found out through different studies through different companies and, and uh, you know like Purdue University and I, uh, I can't remember Sir, uh, Sir, Sir Genta? Syngenta. Syngenta. thank you uh, they, they release studies that show that the more when you use a celebrant and you can get it down earlier it has it once it gets into the soil it has a, a longer effect so instead of trying to put it down when the grubs are really going to be there, we, we, we're kind of get them when they're in a different stage, when they're still in that, you know, the larval stage is still very young, and it's easier to control the grubs at that point in time. Uh, and then we also, and you, if per ounce of a celeprin, you, I think it's for every two ounces of um, a celeprin, you get like two months of protection. Okay. I could be wrong on that, don't yeah. quote me. but. Do the research. Is the grub control? Is that a pretty? Is that a big deal with cool season grasses? Will the grubs 
it, ha hammer them pretty bad. What, yeah, here, here and here's it's a catch twenty two because people that have junky lawns they don't think that they need it, but when you get when you grow a beautiful lush lawn and you've got great soils underneath it, that's when the grubs will, will target that the moths that are coming they. You know, it's like looking at a buffet. Do you want to do you want to look at that the, the buffet that looks really sketchy and you're like, yeah. Ugh. or do you want to go to that like Las Vegas style buffet where yeah. you know it's like everything it's like this each everything looks like it could be it's a main course at a regular restaurant. You know, you you want that juiciness. You want that good looking supple. Yeah. Whoa, you know the beautiful one. Um, so that's that's the thing. That's why with our our program, it's not optional. It is part of our, our plan. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, with, uh, you know, Kentucky bluegrass, the tall fescues, and rye grasses that we have, uh, we also go ahead and we put, we, we will blanket spray a, uh, a product like either Triplet or Escalade 2, or, you know, I don't know if I should say very specific brands, but just it, it, more... Uh, Look at your chemical variations. I would just recommend that because if you, if your area um, restricts like a 2,4-D product, which would be like most common three ways triplets and things like that, they, they have 2,4-D in them. Uh, an alternative is Escalade 2, which instead of um, it's an MCPA, dicamba, and I forgot the other component, but it's it's like a three-way itself, but it just does it doesn't have the 2,4-D in it, and we generally tend to rotate these products so that we're not uh, we record how much of each product we're putting in, so that we know yeah. not to go over the uh, maximum rates. So in May, you 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 do the grub control, and are are you like and blanket blanket spraying for, for weed. broadly broadleaf weeds? Because I like I went to Chicago in May about three years ago, and mm -hmm. I was overwhelmed at the number of dandelions. They were yeah. everywhere. I couldn't sure. believe it, and so I thought you need something that's going to kill a dandelion in May, right? <laughs> what as well as the grubs? I, I right. I forgot to to mention one of the things that we do too is with our pre-emergent, when we were using spraying out dimension, we use a product called Defender. Now, yeah. Defender is not a... Uh, the, the cool part about it is when you will still have dandelions that pop out through that, but they don't flower. I got you. So when you look across... Like, you and I will look across the lawn, and our eyes will fixate on a dandelion, yeah. except... You know, there's no flower to it. So when a, a customer looks at it, I they see. just see green. Yeah. And they're like, "This, I don't have any dandelions." It's like yeah. actually, you have a whole patch over here somewhere. Yeah, I got you. But we see it; they don't. Yeah. All right. So on the warm season side, when we get to May, uh, you know, everything should be pretty much green by the end. So, so you're that that helps in some way. And May's actually a, a good time of the year for grass because, or at least my understanding. Some of the concerns of like, or it's transition time, so I got to be careful what herbicides I spray. You're, mm -hmm. you're past that, but you're also in a period where it's hopefully not 95 degrees yet, so you don't have to worry about you, you know, some of the temperature limits on some herbicides. Mm -hmm. So, again, this is where I'm, I'm changing up my program a little bit this year. On my Bermuda Zoysia yards in May, I'm going out with six ounces of Spectacle Flow. Where in the past I, I wasn't doing that. I was doing two rounds of Prodiamine early in the year. And then I would uh, start fertilizing in April, come back with more fertilizer in May and June, and, and then do weed control. So now I'm going prodiamine er, round one, round two, go ahead and put the slow release fertilizer out so that my May is now freed up. Because May's also, you know, if you're just out there fertilizing your home lawn, you got Bermuda and Zoysia and Centipede and St. Augustine, May is a beautiful month to spray, to put your fertilizer mm -hmm. out, okay? But for my schedule, it's also the, the great month to put the Spectacle Flow out to try to get ahead of dove weed and Kalinga and Spurge and Chamber Bitter and all these weeds that, that we just get killed with. Um, I'm going to try to do a little bit better job on the, on, the, on the weed control side by doing that in May. Um, so anyway, that's why I bumped my fertilizer up to round two, round three, Spectacle Flow in May. Um, and then uh, I'm going to go ahead and move into June, and, and so on my centipede St. Augustine yards, I'm, I'm using, a, I'm not doing spectacle flow then. They, they typically don't have quite as big a problem with, 
with the dove weed, which is one of the main ones I'm trying to get ahead of. Um, but by May, the centipede sound seeds are green, so I could go in there with, if they've got weeds, I can go in there with a low rate of product like Change Up or, or and mix it with some Metzofuron and be able to clean up a lot of the weeds that are in those um, centipede and St. Augustine lawns. So, uh, and as I go into June, that's when on our zoysia lawns, we, uh, we do put the grub control out. And so I'm going to do that in, in May or June time frames. Also, uh, April, May is a good time to be fertilizing your shrubs, things like that. Everything's starting to grow. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in June, like I said, I'm, I'm coming back after the, after the spectacle flow, I'm coming back with another round of the slow release fertilizer that's going to carry me through the rest of the growing season. So um, pick me up on your plan, John, as far as uh, you, you've got coming your grub control yeah. down, you, you've got you, you got your early fertilizer down in the springtime. Mm -hmm. Now, what's what's going on starting in June? It, we start preparing the lawns for the upcoming heat. Usually, it doesn't really kick off until July, but we use a slow release uh, fertilizer with biosolids in it uh, to make sure that it's got enough nutrients in it to get it through the hot spell. Yeah, because we it's weird with cool season. We have the beginning of spring up until, yeah, you know, maybe mid-July before it gets way too hot. And it's growing, it could grow, you know, eight inches in a week. I've seen it. It's crazy how fast yeah. it grows. <laughs> so it, you get, you have all, that's why our very first round, it's not, it, you're not, all you're doing is trying to wake it up. You're not trying to fertilize for a long time. Because it'd be growing so fast you exactly. couldn't hardly keep up with it. So you have that period of time, and then you have this little hot spot, which will go sometimes mid-July, I mean, sometimes all the way to mid-September. So what you, And you don't want to be force-feeding a lawn that's under stress because Kentucky bluegrass and, uh, I mean, fescue does well, but we don't have as many tall fescue lawns in our area we technically we have pr predominantly kentucky bluegrass lawns and if you get tall fescue in it the tall fescue becomes a weed okay well but how but, do you keep a cool season lawn looking decent when it's 90 degrees yeah so this is the point you know you have a uh, we put down a slow release uh, fertilizer and then i like i said we add biosolids to that uh, we also use a couple other soil amendments just to make everything happy. Uh, and then we spot spray for weeds. Once it has all those things in there, our customers will be happier because they're not going to see the weeds. Plus, they're going to see that the, the color stays in the lawn longer because we're not just throwing an all-mineral, uh, you know, just a, like a straight urea fertilizer down. We're using something that is either polymer-coated to extend that um, uh, that release rate, so in the middle of summer, as that those the nitrogen, and, uh, the phosphorus, and potassium are more, are available, the lawn could decide if it's going to take it in or not. Mm -hmm. We're not just sitting there like hammering it and then frying out the lawn. So if and I, f I feel like I'm not being humble at this point, but. When I look at my lawns compared to several other companies' lawns, the, mine stay greener longer. Yeah. And part of that too is also, you know, the, how the, the watering uh, habits of your clients. I have a lot of clients that do not water and they do not have irrigation systems. So I had to custom build my fertilizer to match our area I and see. the conditions. All right, so that's in the summer months. Like for us, you know, it's funny about the cool season grasses. They're they're booming in the springtime, and then they struggle with the summer heat. Ours, they're just waking up in the springtime, and then, and then the hotter the better, really. I mean, for Bermuda grass, when it's a hundred, I mean, it's it's fine. A hundred is fine if it has water. Now, a hundred, no rain and no irrigation can. can uh, definitely not be ideal but if it's raining and consistently in the 90s it's that's when it loves the weather so june july august is you know peak seasons for maximum growth on your bermuda and that's when you want that uh, you want the color for the bermuda the zoysia centipede st augustine so um, your bermuda zoysia is going to take a little bit more nitrogen so again we put out the slow release fertilizer um, 
I'm using a, a little bit different plant on the fertilizer for the centipede and St. Augustine. I'll fertilize them in May, come back again in July to fertilize, but lower nitrogen rates, you know, no more than two pounds of nitrogen for the calendar year. So like um, a little less than a pound in May, a little less than a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet uh, in July. Now the Bermuda zoysias, you, you can you can put more on there, but you got to be careful. You know how how often do you want does a customer want to be mowing their grass? So and I mean, how much uh, do you want to pay for fertilizer? So um, usually around uh, two to you know two to two point two is uh, pounds per nitrogen on these applications, um, and that's got you know the one in the spring is, is a lower amount of nitrogen because like, again the grass is just waking up. And it's going to start helping it get an early. Uh, green up, but in the summer when I come back and fertilize again in May and June, this is prime time here for the grass to really grow. So again, putting out somewhere between two and 2.2 pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. I'm using this year it's like a 3807 or something like so. It's a it's a high nitrogen fertilizer blend. It's gonna, but it's a slow release, so it's gonna feed the grass for the rest of the growing season. Then when I get in July and August, you got to be a little bit careful if it's super hot. Uh, but this this time of year, that's when your nut sedge and the right. kalinga and all that's just going crazy. You know, especially if we had a lot of rain. So at that point, we kind of switching. We got our fertilizer down. Now, if you're using just quick release fertilizer, you may have to keep fertilizing. But I'm just fertilizing twice a year with slow release. And this time, as we get in July and August, I'm basically trying to stay ahead of the the nut sedge, the spurs, the all the you know lespedeza and stuff like that that we're seeing in the lawns out spot treating stuff with products like Celsius and Certainty and Pro Sedge and there, there's tons of sedge product Dismiss and Dismiss NXT and Dismiss South and mm. you know they all work to some extent but there's not, not like a, a one shot just kills everything uh, I guess Tribute Total would be your best option for that in a Bermuda in a Zoysia lawn but anyway mm -hmm. so Moving forward in the summer, July, August, is, right. is it, so the grass is still just kind of hanging in there. It's hanging in there, and it's, you know, as long as it, it, it so if it's super hot, it'll start to go dormant. Yeah. So it'll stay kind of green, but you'll start to see the fading, you know, uh, which is, it's still okay to, I wouldn't push it too hard on yeah. on, on anything, but uh, during this time, that, that that's when we use the heat to our advantage. I do it. It's not commonplace in my area, but I use a liquid dethatching uh, compound that essentially all it does is once you spray it out, it uses the heat to break down the thatch and it helps control the thatch layer and keep it healthy for, uh, for the lawn. So when it breaks all those things down, it acts as its own self, uh, it's, it acts as its own slow release yeah, uh, uh, fertilizer. And during this time, we switch over, like for weed control, we switch over our chemical. Uh, we'll use, we'll usually have like a, a product like Sure Power uh, that works really well once, like past like June fifteenth. That's kind of like we just the, the the fault will switch for spot spraying our weeds. We don't broadcast that. Uh, because it can, yeah. It can, you can track up your lawn even with if you, even if you're walking with a backpack or a, uh, I forgot what they're called, but it's kind of like a it's a sprayer that you walk behind. I've on. seen those. Uh, I, I don't I don't know what you call them. I've seen some guys that use those and they blanket sprayed and then they have the tire tracks from the. Is it like a hawk hawk? spray hawk or something? Like something that. like that. I don't know, but I yeah we don't we're not um. We're not blanking our yards in the in the yeah. There's no summer blanking. anyway. It's just it's a little risky if it's hot and dry. Mm -hmm. You you run a risk, and um, of course you want to follow the label. Some of those products are going to tell you not to spray it. And even in a spot spray, if you have this luxury, you can get out there earlier in the morning. Yes. Or or in, or late in the evening. You know, 95 in the summer, no rain the past three weeks is not a good day yeah. to go out there and blanket the whole yard because you had three blades of nut sage popping up. Right. The, with uh, especially. If you're using certain uh, chemicals, I think is it dicamba has more of a volatile drift. Um, well, drift you know, we use, to... like for us, we, we use like dismissed products like mm. uh, Blindside, anything that the sulfitrazone in it, you know, right. you, you run. And sometimes you want to maybe leave out your surfactant because that's going to heat it up even a little bit more. So, right. you got to be, you got to be, uh, use common sense. Some <laughs> people go crazy on the weed control. Yes, we want to get rid of the weeds, but. 
um, you know, if the lawn is already stressed, it, it's just like, I, I think it's just a, it's common sense, but you want to understand that the grasses don't like herbicide. They are no. tolerant of herbicide. The weeds, you know, aren't tolerant of it. Grasses, it's not good for the grass. I mean, you know, obviously getting rid of the weeds is good for the grass, but um, if the grass is already showing signs of stress, you definitely don't want to go out there and stress it out more by spraying a herbicide yeah, exactly. on it. Exactly. It's not, a, yeah, grass is not immune to these herbicides. Yeah. It, the, it, it's, yeah, it'll, it will brown them out or if you spot spray too much, yeah. it will kill them. Uh, and that's why no matter what equipment you're using, it's always, I always recommend having two or three backpack sprayers so that you could have your different formulations at hand. You know, it's sometimes, you know, we, instead of having the nurse tank filling up, it's like, ah, we're not going to be using that much. Yeah. We could just have maybe two backpack sprayers mm -hmm. just filled with the same chemical ready to go. We have them marked so it's easy to see. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if you're, most of the things that we're spraying at that time is, you know, Sure Power, uh, like a Queen Clorac. Uh, depending on how hot it is, we may or may not use methylated seed oil with it. Um, and then uh, for our nuts edges that pop up, yeah. you know, we have we have we have we'll have like a hand can for. What's your go-to sedge product? Uh, it's, I think it's usually sedge hammer. You know, okay. it, it yeah. works. You yeah. know, we've used. Oh, you know, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Vexus. It's a well, granular. Yeah, the Vexus is the new. Uh, well, yeah. it came out two or three years ago, but it's right. a granular product that you can sprinkle on. It's supposed to reduce uh, the amount that comes back the following year. Yeah, we we've been playing with that. It comes in a nice little shaker. So yeah. It's uh, when we see that we'll spray the sedge and then we'll I'll throw down a little bit of the Vexus in there okay. just to because you know how nut sedge is. You see two or three of them. You might treat that one, and you go, I just sprayed that, and it didn't go away, but there was other sedges that you didn't see yeah. that are there. Yeah, it is, it is a terrible weed to yeah. get rid of. But as we move into fall, I know things, uh, are you, am I cutting Look, you off? Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say, there is a option, because uh, with our program, we have six steps, but there are optional things that we do to help generate more money and to solve other problems where uh, because between the uh, that period is like a six week period so we'll add in if the, we see that uh, there's a lawn that needs uh, is prone to fungus you know like dollar spot or, or brown patch we don't really get too much brown patch but there are diseases up by us that if you don't jump on them they can really yeah make your uh, customer unhappy because yes. you, they're like, why? I'm paying you money. Why is my brown lawn and it's got all these spots? So for those that need it, we offer a, uh, a fungicide program, and that's usually the, the preventative is much cheaper and more effective than the recovery. Yes. Uh, so we have a three-step fungicide program, and we just rotate our our chemicals in and out because if you're read the labels on all of your fungicides but if you have a three-step program you might only be able to use one product back to back to you know two product two two applications with the same product and then on the third one you have to change it up to something not just a different name but one that's in a different category yeah they, they'll have uh, I just watched a course on this but they'll have categories mm -hmm. uh, the, there's a number system that's out there and it'll and it's all about Helping not um, the lawns not develop resistance even with herbicides and things like that. Right. But yeah, you got to mix up the category number. It's probably a big number on the jug of your mm -hmm. herbicide or your fungicide. And that's yeah, that's why we rotate our uh, even with our herbicides. We not only rotate them through the year, but we may jump to a whole different category the next season, so that there's. The, we're trying to minimize that risk of resistance. So. All right, so moving into the fall, and I know that's where there's going to be a big um, some differences. That as the weather cools off, our warm season grasses begin to uh, begin to lose their color. You, you, you're trying, you're hoping that that fertilizer you put out is is holding in there and still giving the grass enough nitrogen to, to maintain color on into September, even October. Um, but 
you know, you don't want to push the nitrogen too hard at that point. So uh, again, with the slow release I'm using, I'm putting it out in May or June, and it, it's it's still ha releasing a little bit of nitrogen, but not um, not as much by then. But again, just trying to hold color and still uh, keep it looking uh, decent on in on into the fall months. But uh, in September, and this is where the calendar plays, uh, the, the weather is going to play a role because uh, I'll start putting out my fall pre and post emergent application in September. Uh, but if it's you know, sometimes, and, and you alluded to this, if it's 90 degrees and, and dry on September 1st, then I might delay that a little bit and, and wait till mid-September or so. And again, it's going to vary depending on where you live and all that. Um, but it's also varies year to year on the weather. But like sometimes in early September, maybe we get a little cool spell and it's, it's dropped it down. We've had plenty of rain. And so I'm using spectacle flow. It's a six and a half ounces per acre on my Bermuda Zoysia lines using four ounces all my centipede and St. Augustine lawns and then putting 2,4-D in there with on the Bermuda zoysias uh, as well as Simazine on the um, centipede St. Augustine's it's, it's just the four ounces of spectacle flow as well as the Simazine, two pints of Simazine and surfactant mm -hmm. and putting that in and uh, and that's what I'm trying to get ahead of all the cool season weeds with so the poa and the henbit and all the weeds of you, you see the following spring you know, if I can get this application out in, in September, October, uh, hopefully before the weather starts turning cool. And, um, and this also is a time when, uh, for us, if, if you have a yard that maybe holds water real bad, it, it, you can have some fungus issues as, as well. You may not see until the following mm -hmm. spring, um, but if you're going to do a fungicide, oftentimes this is a good time to do it before you get those, that that first big cold front comes through in, in late September, October in our area, and it drops down in the, in the upper 40s or low 50s. You walk out and you say, oh man, it feels like fall. You know, well, it's also fall to the weeds, and the cool season weeds are, are going to start mm -hmm. germinating as well as um, you may have some fungus issues. So if you've had a fungus problem in the past, this may be a good time to have your fungicide down and watered in. Uh, fungicide down and watered in before that happens. Mm -hmm. All right, so you guys, everybody and their brother starts aerating and overseeding. Is that is that what goes on in the fall, or is there yeah. any sense of? So you wouldn't do a pre-emergent because that's going right. to hinder your seed. Yeah, unless we're uh, like in our area, the truly one of the best times to do it is is calendar-wise is August fifteenth through September fifteenth because you're still you you still have quite a bit of heat, but you're, it, it's going to allow your grass seed to have the best chance of survival and get established before we get our cold weather coming in. Uh, so in my region, I'm literally right by, like, right by Chicago. I am 14 miles away from the lake. Okay. Um, I'm in Indiana, though, but it's, uh, our region takes... That's one of the better times if you are going to aerate overseed. Uh, but as far as our applications go, as the heat is dying out, this is the time to kind of give the grass a little pep up. Now, we're, like you said, we're not going to hammer it. We're going to use a product that's like a lower uh, input, but we're going to use like an 818 or an 8, you know, a 904. You know, so those are some of the variations we use. Uh, and they're not, they're not slow release. They're just... Uh, they're uh, just a natural product, and it's it gives it just a little nudge. Again, we're only putting down about a third to a, a half a pound of nitrogen per thousand. And uh, at this time, usually, you know, you'll get a couple few stray weeds, but we'll basically have the lawn pretty clean at that point. You can still walk around. We switch over to an, a product that's uh, similar to like T Zone. Where you might have 2,4-D, uh, triclopyr, and um, is it dicamba? I can't remember my formulation. I I but know. anyway, it's you know something similar to T Zone is a great one because you're st you know a lot of uh, ivies and spurges like to develop during that hot time. Uh, if you could get on them earlier in the previous round, it you could uh, really knock them out uh, using a product like that. The triclopyr is the the triclopyr is the key ingredient that really knocks out ground ivy and wild violet um, and 
even the Spurge. Um, so we do that, and uh, if we are going to have uh, overseed, we try to plant it anywhere between August 15th and September 15th. The latest I will go, and this is from years and years of pain and disappointment on my own. My customers don't really care as much because it still comes out good. But I, I have a true blackout date of, like, if they're not done by September 30th, you're not getting any seed because I don't want to deal with the headaches. And I <laughs> so what would happen? It would get, you would get snow. It wouldn't be warm enough for it to germinate. It, it, what would happen is you don't have enough time. It will grow. But its root system won't be mature oh. enough to develop and w and suffer the winter that we have. Oh, okay. So that's that's because I mean, there's times when you know we get snowfall by uh, by Halloween. Okay. There's other times when it doesn't snow, but we still get cold temperatures yeah, that will knock it out. So that that's the biggest thing for if you're looking at seed as an ad, you know something that you're going to add with your one particular or uh, several of your uh, customers is to make sure that you get that seed down at the right time and then if you are putting that seed down then also make sure that you are uh, your NPK ratios are mm -hmm. kind of like you know the quote-unquote starter fertilizer we don't generally use a uh, uh, like a 20 20 20 a lot of guys do it, that'll work and it's just fine but we we like to balance it out a little bit more to where you know you get more um, you, you got the phosphorus is the leader in this in this mm -hmm. game because it'll help the root development uh, instead of you know just pushing nitrogen and pushing the potassium. So helping it survive the winter basically. Yeah. So and, and so is September thirtieth. Is that kind of like the end of the year for the the end of the lawn calendar for you or, or no. something else happen after? Yeah, that? absolutely. After now, like at this point of the year, we've only put down. Maybe a pound and a half, our, our program we think it put down about a pound and a half by that time of year. Okay. Which when most guys are like, wow, that's really low. Because Kentucky bluegrass could go anywhere from four to six pounds. Okay. So now after that has happened, that's when we set it up for the, the heavier applications. This is when the prime time when your, your Kentucky bluegrass, your tall fescue, your perennial rise, they love they they want to you want to fill their bellies before we, they go into hibernation okay. you know so that's after uh, you know like our round five that is a um, I still use a it, the ratio of slow release and, and quick release is pretty balanced in that one we use biosolids with that we also put down some root uh, growth uh, stimulators we put you know, there's a whole bunch of things that not only feed the lawn but we're um, trying to improve the soil quality uh, so everything that we use is all for the soil uh, and then after that we do move into a winterizer and that could happen anytime in October November depending on the weather and what is a winterizer what what, that, what is that that the, for me that okay that it really is just a term that has been coined by yeah. other companies but for us you we want to We've already f filled it with a quick release to recover from that hot, or from the summer, from that micro feeding. Then we move to the one I was just talking about. It's a, it's a balance of slow and quick release. Now the last one is a quick release because you just want to make sure that that is it. it you don't need. It's not the slow release is not going to do anything for you over the uh, over the winter. It's not going to, you know, it's not really going to get stored in the, the soil. It's just going to deplete, if anything. So we use a quick release, like, uh, of, you know, it could be urea, sometimes it's ammonium sulfate. It's just using those products to make sure that it has a f completely full belly before it goes to bed. I got you. And I find that almost all of our lawns that get that last application are faster to green up in the spring. I see. So we, with our, with my program, we're doing four, roughly four pounds of nitrogen for the entire season. So when you add up all the nitrogen inputs throughout the year, we have four pounds. Um, that's why in the springtime we don't need to hit it with a big, you know, a, a, like a whole pound of nitrogen. We could just 
give it a little micro feeding and it's just going to help carry that okay. green over, green up over. So after that last nitrogen application winterizer, then, mm -hmm. then you get buried in snow and the game's over. Pretty much. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So um, that's interesting. So I'm learning, learning some stuff here along with you. But I, for us, uh, like I said, we did our fall pre and post merger September, October, and then we come back in November, December, and we're putting out lime on the yard. Now, some areas, uh, we do that pretty much standard with all customers because the area I live in, the, the soil is acidic. It's just acidic almost over the whole area with, with some exceptions. But um, in other areas, you know, the soil may not be as acidic and, or maybe in some, you know, some it is, some it's not. So in those situations, you may want to do a soil test or if you know you don't have acidic soil, um, then you obviously wouldn't want to put out lime. But in areas like where we live, that's pretty standard for the um, because of just the type of soil um, mm -hmm. that we have. So, and that's pretty much what everybody's doing November, December. Try to get done a little early so we can be off for the holidays. And uh, there's no magical time necessarily to put the lime out then, but that is a, a break in our schedule. So that's that's what we do. And then again, when the calendar rolls back over, we're back spraying pre-emergence on January the 2nd again. So, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully this video, you guys feel free to engage in the, in the comments section, but uh, hopefully, it, at least give you a, a game plan of what you're trying to do over the calendar year. Because I know it can be confusing if you if you see people out spraying. You're like, well, I know they're spraying, but I don't know what they're spraying, or, or mm -hmm. you know, because it, you, sometimes I think people think that you just spray. There's one magic weed product. If you just go spray it, you won't have any weeds, and then you just fertilize occasionally, and that <laughs> it pretty much is all there is to it, you know. And it it, it actually is fairly complicated, um, but. It, it's it's not it's not something impossible to learn. You just have to learn kind of the principles. Why are we spraying a pre-emergent at this time? Why are we putting out these post-emergent? And why are we using um, this amount of fertilizer or these types of fertilizer? Um, you, you know, it just doesn't make sense to fertilize when the grass is not growing. Or, or you know, it, so anyway, there's just mm -hmm. some basic principles. But appreciate John being with us. Um, we both have resources over it if you want help with this. I've got my website, LawnCareLife.com, where I have uh, resources. They're, they're going to be more geared toward warm season grasses. John, uh, has. we both have resources at TheGreenIndustryPodcast.com, mm -hmm. which is Paul Jamison's uh, his website. And what, t John, tell them what, you, what is your resource that you're selling over there. You, John does a lot of people, talking with people about uh, helping them grow a successful uh, business and getting into the number side mm -hmm. of it. The main product is the Budgets Break Evens and Bottom Lines Workshop and I help business owners build budgets so that they could have profitable price points for their services. And the other one that's going to be coming out very soon is the uh, Technical Guide to Operating a Successful Lawn Care Business. So that All one, right. those two are go there. Fun. Well, appreciate uh, you guys watching. Like I said we're down here hanging out in um, Florida at the time of this video. Y'all can also check out the Entrepreneur Academy, Brian Fullerton's mm -hmm. uh, website, and then, uh, Caleb and Brittany Allman with the Hardscape Academy. If you're looking to start a lawn maintenance business, go to Entrepreneur Academy. If you're looking to uh, get into hardscaping and want to learn about that, go to uh, the, the Allman's Hardscape Academy. So check those out. You can also follow them on social media, things like that. Appreciate you watching. We'll talk to you next time. Bye.